Sets the sun and calls the dawn. Who breathed me out of dust to life? The will to trust or run and hide. I will stay.
Thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the beautiful weather. Thank you for your word. Thank you for our freedom to gather here. Lord, bless this day and bless, bless our hearts that they will be penetrated by this word and that we can know you better. Amen. Well, welcome to our worship this evening. Everybody that's here with us live and those online, Well, I was just going to get ripping on this, but it occurs to me that I can't recall which hand Pastor Cliff holds the mic in, so I guess I have to come clean and confess. I am not Pastor Cliff. I, my name's Dave Ray. I am Pastor Cliff's stunt double, and as you may know, the stunt double is the guy that comes in, uh, who is often, by the way, much less paid than the actual actor, often better looking, but the stunt double is the guy that gets to come in and do the things that the, the main actor either doesn't want to do, can't do, or not allowed to do. So that's my role tonight. I'm going to come in here as Pastor Cliff's stunt double. And I got thinking about that and thinking, wow, wouldn't it be nice to have a stunt double in real life? I mean, think of all the things that you could send your stunt double to do. Monday mornings, Tuesday mornings. <laughs> Basically, every morning you got to go to a job. I'd love to have a stunt double to do that. Um, you know, having dinner with the, the, the family member that you don't really care for that much, send the stunt double. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of other things. Going to the dentist, send the stunt double. That could really be a, a useful thing. But what about things like going out for ice cream or going on vacation? Would you send a stunt double to do those things? Oh, no. We're going to keep the fun things for ourselves, right? I mean, that's what the stunt double is for, to do that stuff you don't want to do. But what about things like going to church? or volunteering to work at church functions or community events that are reaching out to help other people. What about those things? Are those things that you'd want to send a stunt double to do for you or do yourself? See, when it comes to anything that we're not comfortable with and things that we don't want to do or, or don't particularly find fun, I, I think we all have this tendency to want to send in the stunt double. See, we all actually have a stunt double. And we all actually have the same stunt double. His name's somebody else. Sometimes also goes by uh, the, the nickname, not me. 
And all too often, we use this stunt double to do things that really we should be doing, but just don't want to do. And, and I tell you, that guy seems to really get around, because there's a lot of somebody else out there that I see doing things. So I'd like to, as, as we move on to this, I'd like to take a minute and go through some scripture here. And I want to see if you can see a common element in this scripture. Let's start out with uh, Matthew 4.19. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Just keep going. For I... <laughs> then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, you, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. So what is it that's a common element in these scriptures? Does anybody pick that up? What is it they all have in common? Action. Do something. All of these scriptures are about going out and doing something. Um, it, it, me. These scriptures and, and countless others throughout the New Testament call us to action. They give us things to do. And the intent is that we do this. Scripture never says... Uh, things like this, for I was hungry and someone else gave me something to eat. Or, therefore, let someone else go out and make disciples. Have someone else take care of my sheep. Scripture tells us that Jesus came to die on the cross for our sins because he was the only one who could do that. Where do you think we'd be if he had said, oh, let somebody else do that? We'd be in a world of trouble. Nowhere in Scripture are we told to let somebody else go do the things that we're told to do or called for to do. We're called personally into action. And we need to take this very seriously. God expects us to take action personally. He gives us commands to do things for a reason. And the entire New Testament is filled with these things that make it clear that we're expected to take action. And if we fail to do that, there will be consequences. So now at this point, you might be thinking, well, but Scripture says all I need is faith. I don't have to have actions. And, and it says that in Romans 3, uh, for it says, we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works in the law. And we see it again in Galatians where it says that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus. So on one hand, we have scripture full of statements that say all we need is faith, but we also have a lot of scripture that says we have to actions that we're expected to do. How do you make sense of that? On the surface, it almost sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? I mean, how can you have both? How can you be saved by faith alone, but yet you still have to do things? So let's take a look at our scripture for today, which comes out of James 2, 14 through, I think I'm going to stop at 18. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food, if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is in one, only one God. That's good, even the demons believe that. Well, before we go much further talking about faith, what is faith? John here, as he's speaking, talks about both faith and deeds, but what is faith actually? I, I, I like a lot of times to go to the dictionaries to, to look things up. Well, in this particular case, I pulled this out of a 1948 dictionary. I was not around when that was written. And it says belief or faith is simply belief in God, revelation or the like as soundness of theology in a practical religious sense, or trust in God. Faith is fidelity to one's promises. Faith is that which is believed. I, I, I like things like that because it almost starts getting circular. Um, or complete confidence in someone or something open to questions or suspicion. These are some of the definitions of faith. Uh, many people define faith simply as something that's unseen, 
something that's unproven. I mean, for example, we have faith in Jesus that he is the Son and God, don't we? That he died for our sins, that he stands before us with God, but we've not witnessed these things ourselves. We just take this on faith. At one time, uh, I, I tried to find it, but I can't find it. It's gone walking somewhere else. But we had a sign around here that actually said, faith is not believing that God can, it's knowing that God will. Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? But these things, the dictionary definitions and these statements of faith is simply something that we, we think internally. This is just intellectual thought. This is, it's, it's absent of actual action. It's things we get from just reading scripture for informational purposes to see what it tells us and choosing that, oh, I'll just, I'll believe that. I'll have faith that that's true. But John was contrasting that faith from genuine saving faith that is accompanied by action. He's tying the two things together. That's the kind of faith that saves us. Uh, Martin Luther once said, uh, summed up faith by saying, we are saved by a faith alone, but not faith that is alone. There's an action part. I suspect if John had read our little sign that was around here, he would modify it to say, faith is not believing that God can, it's knowing that he will and acting accordingly with this knowledge. What John is telling us is that the genuine saving faith, the kind of faith that Jesus is talking about, results in action. It's just a natural uh, result of, of the actual uh, faith that we have. But if our faith is not right, it doesn't just happen, um, then there's not going to be any action that comes from that. John is connecting all of these scriptures, all the scriptures that talk about faith alone saving us and all of the scriptures that call us to do things, and he's connecting those together, showing that the action is a natural result of the faith. This is a big deal. It, this was a very big deal for me when I realized that. When I started to look at Scripture a little differently, I realized instead of the Bible being this just this book of rules, here's all these rules we have to follow and here's all this stuff we have to do, I realized that these things together give us a very powerful tool to help us test and improve our faith. We can look at the actions in our lives and see if it's producing, I'm sorry, we can look at our faith Think about our faith and see if it's producing action in our lives consistent with Scripture. Have you ever had doubts about your faith? You know, I have. Have you ever wondered, you know, is your faith right? Is it strong enough? Or do you even have faith? Well, God knows that we're going to have doubts. He even tells us in Scripture, you know, to, to pray for more faith, to ask for his help. He knew this right from the start that we'd struggle with that, which he gave us this wonderful tool in Scripture that helps us gauge our faith, evaluate our faith, see if it is an action, which helps us understand if it's a healthy faith or if it's just meaningless act. Once we know that we have our faith right, once we really have true saving faith, a lot of the things that we find unpleasant, a lot of those things that we'd like to send the stunt double off to do, we're going to find ourselves wanting to do these things and and actually enjoying them. You know, loving our neighbors that wouldn't be an issue for us. Even the family member that we struggle with at times. Um, our, our jobs, okay, our jobs may still be a pain, but our attitude towards them can change significantly once we have the right saving faith. As you read scripture, you see a lot of examples of the benefits that come from a, a right relationship with God, which is built on that faith giving our time, doing things for others, serving the church, serving God in any number of different ways that he calls us to serve, all of those things will just begin to happen naturally if we have the right saving kind of faith. And this goes on and on. I mean, Scripture tells us all of these great things that can happen just by having faith. So how do we get there? How do we improve our faith? I, 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 that's something that I, I know I've struggled with is, you know, how do you do that? I mean, you've probably, if you've ever asked somebody, you've probably heard something as simple as, well, just pray for more. And that's good, and, and it does start there, but there, there can be so much more to it than that. Uh, one, of the, one of the movie lines, if, if you've ever seen Evan Almighty, there's a scene in there that I really liked where God is talking to his wife, who had earlier in the movie prayed for the family to be closer. And he said, you know, if somebody prays for that, does God just zap them with warm, fuzzy feelings? Or does he put them in situations where they have to love each other? 
The same is true with faith. If we pray for faith, do you think God just says, boom, you have faith? No, he gives us opportunities to demonstrate that faith through action. And in doing so, that will strengthen our faith. So what comes first? Well, certainly we can start with prayer. We can start with studying scripture. And I don't mean reading scripture for knowledge from an intellectual point of view. Really get into the stories that Jesus told that deal with action. Ask yourself as you're reading these things, ask God to help you. Hey, where am I in this? How does this apply to me? How does this action that you're, you're calling for, uh, re- how should it be reflected in my life? What can I do? Ask those questions. And I'll bet if you're like me, at times you're afraid to ask that question, aren't you? Sometimes the scary thing is to ask the Lord is, hey, what would you like me to do today? Because you might not like the answer, right? Oh, wait, no, that wasn't, in my, that wasn't on my list. But that's where, that's where it has to be, come from, is we have to ask for that guidance. What is it that you would like me to do? And really get into the scriptures and ask probing questions. Ask God that. He he's welcomes us asking him questions and he'll help us find answers. Another approach is to build our faith is start with the doing. Get out and do things that the Lord calls us to do. Look for opportunities, you know, at the church, out in the community. Look to your, your neighbors, friends, and reach out like Jesus would and just start doing and it sounds odd, but if you do, even if you start with the action and you start doing things, you're going to find so much enjoyment that comes from that as you realize, wow, man, I'm doing something that really is pleasing to God. And that will actually help increase your faith. So you can really start from either end. You can start from Scripture and ask for guidance, or you can just dig in and start doing things. And either one leads to strengthening your faith And that builds the deeper relationship with God, which we definitely need. Sounds like a lot of work? Perhaps it will be, especially getting started. If you're like me, you're not quick to get started with things that, you know, you don't necessarily (laughs) want to do when you have other things you feel you would have more fun doing. But it is a lot of work, but the Benefits are beyond measure. The scripture, as you read through it, will, will explain a lot of the benefits of a right relationship built on faith and serving God, all the great things that come from our lives. Our stress is reduced. Our relationships, not just with God, with each other get better. You know, our situation may not get any better. He doesn't promise us that suddenly he's going to transport us into some happy place where, you know, we love our job and everything's perfect. But we will see that situation more appropriately from a, a long-term point of view, if you will relative to God's plan, which will really improve the quality of life. And ultimately, the benefit is an eternity with God in a very nice place. The the consequence of a wrong relationship with God is much less pleasant. It's certainly eternity, but it's an eternity in in a place you just don't want to be. I mean, if you may think your life's a bummer now, uh, imagine a life with a, in, in a complete absence of anything godly. You think this world is rough now. Imagine what it would be with no godly influence. There is a lot of good in this world right now. We may not see it. You certainly don't see it in the media. But it is there. But just imagine if all that was gone. That's where we're headed if we don't have a saving faith in God. So... If it still sounds like too much work, and maybe you're tempted to just lean on the, well, but I have the faith part. I'm okay. Consider this. So Jesus himself tells us repeatedly that faith in him requires, or that faith in him is required for salvation. So we have to have faith. But he also calls us to action. A lot of action. And then throughout scripture, we're told that true saving faith does result in action. And it tells us that faith without action is dead. Consider James 2. As the body without spirit is dead, so, it, so faith without deeds is dead. If we look at our lives and we're not seeing good biblical strength action, and I, and I mean biblical strength action, doing things consistent with what God calls for, not just keeping ourselves busy doing a lot of things. I mean, I'm sure we all have a lot of action in our life, but it's got to be the right action. If we don't see that, what does that say about our faith? And, and if we don't see that, 
and we kind of come to the conclusion that our faith maybe is weak or even not there, what does that say about our salvation? See, these things are very closely tied together. It's not one or the other. I can do one or the other. I only need faith or I only need actions. We, we need both. And that's something that we just have to focus through. Jesus tells us in Matthew 7 that enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only if you find it. Now I'm sure all Christians think, oh, well, that, that road's certainly going to be wide enough for me. But then you have to ask yourself, if, if the faith isn't there, if I'm not seeing evidence of that faith in the deeds in my life, yeah, maybe that road's a lot narrower than, than I realized. And that doesn't lead to the right place. Father, help us to use your word honestly to evaluate our lives to evaluate our faith, to see where we're lacking, to see what we can improve and what we can do to deepen our faith in you. Help us change our lives so that our actions reflect that faith and demonstrate that faith and prove that it is really there and that it is solid and that it will save us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. or anything or <laughs> yeah <laughs>